of I, a place full of wonder, mystery, and absolute serene beauty. A place that everybody thinks about when it comes to vacation time. Welcome back to the swamp and welcome if you're new my friends. Today I'm going to be sharing some creepy and allegedly true Hawaii horror stories sent in by viewers just like you. As always, my friends, if you have a story that you would like to share in a future episode, be sure to submit your story at swampdweller.net or the email you can find in the description down below. I'm currently trying to cover every single United State, so be sure to send in stories from the states. We've already covered most of them, but we still got quite a few to go. Reading a few stories for me today is my good friend and host of my gaming podcast, The Dark Side of Gaming, Derek Weber. If you enjoy his voice and the stories he's told today, be sure to check out the link in the description to subscribe to his channel and check out our gaming podcast, The Dark Side of Gaming. Now, without further ado, let us jump right into these creepy and allegedly true Hawaii horror stories that'll freak you out tonight. Hello, my name is Ari. I'm 17 years old and live in Hawaii. I was born here and have pretty much lived my entire life here. Growing up here is different. I do believe I wouldn't be the person I am if I hadn't gone through the things that I've experienced growing up here. Anyone local can tell you a handful of spooky things about this island off the back of their hand. Almost everyone has had their own share of personal experiences. I live in an interesting neighborhood. My neighborhood has only one street light, and it's at the entrance of the neighborhood next to the community mailboxes. I live on the same road as the mailboxes, but a few houses down. The houses are pretty spread out and you can only see the front yards and some of the front part of the house because of the overgrown forest surrounding them. My neighborhood is thick, lush forest that goes up the side of a mountain. There are two main paved roads that go two ways. They both go up the mountain deeper into the neighborhood. The main road is called Diamond Head. It goes straight to the top of the neighborhood and has 15 dirt roads that turn off into separate ways. I don't ever walk Diamond Head unless I have to. I walk the other road though. It's the same one I live on, but it turns up the mountain a little way past where you turn up Diamond Head. Every day I walk my dog, Regina, all the way to the top, and then we turn left and walk two to three miles in the woods. The paved road continues for at least a mile and then turns down a dirt road that continues for a much longer walk. There are only a few cow farms out there. I've only gotten far enough to pass one of them though. I enjoy spending time out there normally. It's so beautiful and Regina loves it. I like to spend as much time outside as I can so I usually spend hours out there. This one day went a little bit different though. I already wasn't in a good mood but I started to feel better when me and Regina got to our spot. I let her off the leash and she ran next to me as I skateboarded the paved road. We got comfortable. I sat on the side of the road to take some pictures of this little bright green grasshopper who sat up on a yellow flower while Regina sat beside me. We weren't even up there for that long. We hadn't even gone that far in. Regina suddenly let out this deep growl which took me off guard. I just thought it was someone on their morning walk, but when I looked over, nothing was there. But I suddenly got lightheaded. I struggled to put my camera back in my bag and get Reggie's leash. I tried to get her back on it, but she lunges forward and let this god-awful scream out. She was barking, growling, and making noises that I've never heard her make before. All her hair on her body stood up. I pulled back on her leash and tried to scope out what she was seeing, but I couldn't see a thing. Regina was really scaring me at this point. She was lunging forward and really trying to get whatever was there, hopping forward, snapping her jaws, everything you'd expect an aggressive dog to be doing. I had never seen her act this way. It all happened in such a fast manner that I had this feeling like something really didn't want me to be there. I skated out of there as fast as I could. The whole time I skated, Regina ran with her tail between her legs looking back as we got farther away. I felt like something was at my ankles the entire time too. I was too scared to look back though in fear that I might see something. This event just made me uncomfortable. Nothing up there has happened like that since then, but things are now happening at my house. It sucks because I really started to think things were settling down a bit after last year and all. Last year was eventful. Things started to get crazy when I moved back after freshman year in Portland. I didn't have electricity for a year when I first moved back to Hawaii. When you live in a house with no power, you really start to pay attention to your surroundings. 
My mom used to leave me home alone with my little sister while she was out working, and sometimes she wouldn't come home until the next morning. So there were a few times where me and my sister went through some pretty scary things all alone. One time when my mom wasn't home, me and my sister were chilling in my bedroom, which was the back room of the house. We had our flashlight and a candle lit. We had been listening to something fly around the house for 10 minutes. It would land on the roof with a loud bang and then it would slowly creep around back and forth. We could hear sharp scratching and clicking noises. It would walk in different patterns. First it would be on two feet and then it would sound like it was on all four. The scratching of long, sharp nails above us really freaked me out. It really sounded like it was a big dog up there when it would run, but at the same time it sounded like a person. It's really hard to explain. It sounded as heavy as a human, but the noises it made didn't come close. Me and my sister huddled in the corner of my room, sitting on my bed with one flashlight. The scariest part would be when it got quiet. The walls to that room were mostly glass. One giant glass window, a window on the ceiling to see the stars, and a giant sliding glass door. Sometimes when it got quiet, we could hear something on the porch next to the giant window a little tap on the glass or a long slow scratch down the side of the glass. Us, not being able to see anything because of how dark it was outside, but knowing something could see us in here was the most uncomfortable feeling I had ever, ever experienced. These events are the ones that really truly scare me. We stayed quiet in that room listening to whatever was outside for quite some time. I couldn't really tell you how long it had been. We'd hear the occasional flying sound of it flying around the house the screech every so often as well, I could still hear it in my brain sometimes. It's something I don't know I'll ever be able to forget. It just echoes in the back of my mind. Sometimes I know it's not just my imagination though. That night went on for so long. My poor little sister was so scared and I did my best to protect myself and hold myself together. It was hard in the end though. We had a landline connected downstairs outside. Since we didn't have any electricity, my mom's boyfriend tweaked our landline to work on an electrical box next door. So I heard the phone ring and I wanted to know if it was our mom or not. So I get up and so does my sister. She brings the light for me to see but waits at the top of the stairs. I answer the phone, but it wasn't my mom. It was my best friend calling to tell me that she found my guard dog in town and she could bring her home. This made me so relieved because this was my childhood dog who's always made me feel safe. I told her thank you, but before I could say anything else, my sister screamed. My head snapped around and she was standing there, pointing in the sky above my driveway. Hovering above the tree line was a giant glowing orb and it blinked like a disco ball. When I blinked, the whole sky lit up like someone was turning a light on. All I remember is dropping the phone, running up the stairs, grabbing my sister and slamming the door right behind us. She was crying. I was baffled and holding her. Not too long after that, my friend brought our dog back and we felt much safe. Not too long after that, my friend brought our dog back and we felt much safer. But after they left, the screeching came back in full force. This time, my neighbor's dog was outside and was losing their mind, barking incessantly. The screeching was getting louder, but then the dog screamed, and then it all went quiet. My neighbor's dog was missing for a few days, but then was found severely injured in a lava tube behind my neighbor's house. After that night happened, I realized it wasn't the first time I had heard the screeching and flying sounds. The first time was a month after I moved back from Portland and I was sleeping over at my homie's house who ironically didn't have electricity either. So him and myself and two of our other homies were sleeping on the couches in his living room. His house is also made from glass. Super cool, but it's not fully built yet and that's why there's no electricity. There also aren't any doors, so there are three openings to his house one where his dog is tied up on her runner that leads outside and inside so she can sleep on her bed in the house and guard the main floor. It was late and we were all falling asleep, but I was wide awake because I had sleeping issues at this time in my life. So I was just laying there trying to fall asleep and I noticed how the dogs in the neighborhood all started barking at the same time. This happens every night. Every night, the same time every night. The dogs at the bottom of the mountain start barking first and it slowly makes its way up to the top. I'm laying there listening to the howls and the barks get closer. It's slowly making its way up the streets. My homie's dog starts to growl. She went outside to check things out for a minute or two but started whining and came back inside. It was about 20 minutes or so when I started hearing flapping sounds above the house. 
The dog didn't notice it, so I was eh about it, until I heard it land in the front yard. I heard the gravel driveway crunch as something crept towards the house. Then, the light sensor came on and that's when homie's dog lost it. Her head snapped up as she made eye contact with whatever this thing was outside. I watched her eyes narrow in the moonlight as her hair slowly stood up, but she didn't move an inch. She growled a little bit but stayed still. She wasn't even blinking. I heard the gravel crunch one more time and that's when homie's dog took off towards whatever was out there. She never made it outside before it took back off into the sky with one loud whooshing sound. I didn't think much of that event until what happened with my sister. I told my mom about it and come to my surprise she knew what I was talking about and have even had her own experiences with it. So has her boyfriend and this other guy they used to be friends with. I have so many new things that have been happening that I'd like to share with you. So many things that have just happened in this week. It's all gotten so, so crazy. I mean, I have always experienced weird things, but it stopped for a bit after my sleep paralysis stopped. As a child, I had sleep paralysis for many years and I'd see things I can't even explain, but I always assumed it was something mental or some sort of hallucination. Although my sleep paralysis did stop, I feel like this unlocked my mind in a way to be open to these types of things. Every so often, Regina will freak out and start staring into my closet and barking. But outside of that, things seem to have calmed down a lot, and I haven't heard the whooshing flying sounds or the screeching in quite some time. I don't know what this thing is, what it was, or what it might have wanted. But I'll tell you this, there's something pretty strange going on in Hawaii. She's been following me all week. This story revolves around an EMT who has since left the department, but was known for being sensitive to spirits. I know that makes for one hell of a talent to have in this line of work. We'll call her Charlene, and this takes place at the Hawaii Kai Ambulance Unit back when we had three shifts. She was on the midnight shift from 2300 to 0700. The Hawaii Kai Ambulance Unit is attached to the fire station of the same name. The quarters are small, about 6 feet wide by maybe 15 feet long, where it turns a corner and leads to a shower room and toilet. That front end of the unit has a mini fridge, the computers for charting, a TV, a few chairs, and a recliner, which the senior medic usually sleeps in. At the end where the corner is are the lockers and a small room for supplies. This room is also where the less senior guy sleeps, usually the EMT, and it has a futon on the floor for them to crash on. One night, Charlene was charting on the computer while her partner, Gary, was snoozing away on the recliner. Charlene noticed something behind her and looked to her right, but looking away from a computer screen in a dark room is pretty much pointless, and all she saw were floating blue spots. She then looked to the left to check on Gary, and noticed he was still sleeping, but he was moving his left arm. Must be having a nightmare about starting IVs left-handed or something, she thought. Then Gary lifted his arm up like he was waving at her, then dropped it. Charlene didn't think much of it, and resumed charting. The next day, at 0630, they both woke up having slept through the night without having any other calls, thanks to pure luck or merciful dispatchers, and Gary started asking Charlene about that night. He said, hey, was I doing anything in my sleep last night? Yeah, you kind of moved your arm around. What's up? Well, he said hesitantly, I remember waking up and seeing you at the computer. I don't know why. I just woke up for some reason. I didn't even think that we had a call or anything. Then I see this girl or woman off to my right come out of nowhere where the lockers are, but I can't turn my head. I feel like you saw her too because I remember you looking in her direction. She's getting closer to me and I still can't move and then she walks behind me and I think she stops. You look over at me, and right at that moment, I swear, she puts her hand on mine and lifts my arm up. 
I felt her. I know I did. She was cold. And then I guess I just went back to sleep. Did, did, did you see any of that? He asks nervously. I saw your arm go up. Yeah, she said very casually. What did she look like? And Gary starts describing her. Younger, like in her 20s. Asian, black hair. And then Charlene basically finishes the description for him. He's shocked that she knows all of this. Then she drops another bombshell, ever so casually. She's been following me all week. We went to DOA at the airport hotel, and while we were writing out the death pronouncement, she was standing in the corner, telling me she was sorry and didn't want this to happen. OD'd on pills, looked intentional. She's been following me since. I don't know, maybe she wants me to find her family and tell them. Haunted Stations This one's not really a story in and of itself, but rather a list of places EMS and firefighters know to be haunted. Many of these are in the path of night marchers, ghosts of Hawaiian warriors who led a procession to historic battlegrounds or sacred sites in Hawaiian history. If you're out in their land at night and hear chanting or see a line of torches in the distance, that's them. Supposedly, if you're seen by them, they will kill you. The only way to avoid this, if you're in their path, is either by being recognized by one of their distant relatives or showing respect by laying face down on the ground and keeping your nose in the dirt until they pass. Anyone who has lived here any length of time will have heard them or experienced them. Heck, National Guardsmen on field training exercises have seen the lights at night, but when they look through their NVGs, there's no physical body to be seen. Homes in their path will often have tea plants around the perimeter to discourage them from coming through along with any other spirit. The Wailupe Ambulance Unit is attached to the firehouse of the same name, and they have tea plants around the station. It doesn't seem to work, however, as many EMTs and MICTs have reported odd things happening there. Part of the reason might be because this unit used to be a morgue. There are large double doors on the EVA side with a hearse used to back into the unit to unload bodies. The unit itself has tile from the middle of the wall down to the floor where there's a large drain in the center of the room. Nowadays, there's one bed where the double door is and another on the opposite wall. I've heard of guys getting pressed in the middle of the night in either bed and back when I first started working EMS on midnights, I used to hear footsteps walking around the ambulance while doing the pre-shift check. The old Kahuku unit was at the Kahuku Hospital's former morgue, and the guys there would sleep in the rig because getting pressed was almost a certainty. Another fire station, Kakaako, was partially built over a cemetery for victims of a smallpox epidemic in the 1850s. It was so well known that even the local paper talked about it. Everything from firefighters hearing or seeing things that weren't physically there to getting pressed at night. The Nu'u Anu station's dorm is frequented by the apparition of either a small boy or a menehune, a mythical race of dwarf people. The newest station, East Kapole, was opened in 2014 and already has a reputation. One morning, a firefighter went to grab the paper and saw a body at the base of the training tower. Apparently, a woman with a terminal illness made her way into the tower and jumped from the top. She had been there long enough that her blood soaked into the new concrete floor, which hadn't been sealed yet. They eventually took care of the imprint. The sleeping quarters aren't like the old stations, where it's a bunch of beds separated by partitions. Instead, each firefighter has their own room with a door. One room gives off that sense of dread and a lot of guys don't like sleeping in it. A firefighter who has a sister who was sensitive to spirits decided to call her while walking through the dorm and when he got to that particular room she tells him stop right there. What what is there? I feel something. 
After some back and forth conversation, he tells us that he said that spot happens to be a portal to the other side and suggested having the place be blessed. I don't know if it ever happened. The old Eva Beach station has since been closed, but used to be another hotspot for activity, and the Kaiser Ma'analua Hospital sits just outside the Ma'analaua Valley, another spiritual hotspot. Nurses I've known said doors will close at random, and there's always a feeling of being watched in certain rooms, and nurses with long hair will feel someone touching it in one of the corridors. The valley itself has a hiking trail, and there's a tree just into the trailhead with a branch that several people have hung themselves on. An old medic told me that back in the 80s, after the stock market crash, they went to several hangings there. I've seen the tree on hikes, and while it's a beautiful spot in the daytime, the valley definitely feels creepy at night. Peli Momi Hospital is built over grounds where ancient Hawaiians are believed to have abandoned gravely ill and elderly family members to die. Supposedly, there used to be a large tree there during those times, and the soon-to-be-departed would tell their loved ones of seeing Menehune in the upper branches of the trees. The second floor of the hospital is at the level of where those branches were, and often traveling nurses would complain of unattended children wandering the floor after visitation hours. The locals know they're probably just catching a glimpse of the Menehune. The Iaea ambulance unit used to be quartered in the basement at the end of a hallway where crew members have seen kids walk down. If you follow them, they'll vanish as they round the corner. You brought it back from the cemetery. This one has a funny moment in the middle of it, but the story talks about how a spirit seems to latch on to someone and take up residence at a new place. Back when Honolulu EMS was still on a three-shift schedule, the midnight shift was from 2300 to 0700. Between Young and Baratania Streets near Ka Aomoku sat the Metro and Makiki Ambulance Units at the time, it was a largely empty lot with a few reserve and decommissioned rigs in the back with two office trailers in the front for each unit. I came in for the 3 to 11 and saw a black wig on the TV set, which was mounted in the upper corner of the trailer. What's the story with that? I asked the off-going crew. Well, last night, Makiki gets dispatched to a cemetery where a patient has passed out during a Glenn Grant tour of haunted Hawaii hotspots. It was the last stop of the night, and a patron apparently got so spooked that she lost consciousness for a moment. Now, HFD usually sends a company along to correspond to any potentially time-critical call, like a bad trauma or a code. Since dispatch can't always tell why somebody's down, they'll roll HFD in case it turns out to be a code, and with EMS having less than half as many stations as fire does, fire is usually on the scene first. When Ted and Michelle roll up, sure enough, there's an engine company there. Everyone's left except the patient and one tour guide. Nobody wants to be in a dark cemetery after a night of ghost stories. Neither did fire, and as soon as they heard this was going to be a refusal, they were heading back to the truck. Ted and Michelle were alternating calls all night, and this was Ted's patient. So when they went back to the rig to grab the laptop for the refusal signature, Michelle decided she was going to stay put in the safety of the ambulance with fire close by. After getting the refusal, Ted made his way back to the rig only to find, surprise, surprise, Someone left the radio back out there. That had to be the case because it wasn't in the charger, and since this was Ted's call, Michelle told him that he was going to go back for it. Alone. Ted didn't have a flashlight, but Fire was all too happy to help from the safety of their truck. With only his cell phone for illumination and Fire shining their spotlight on him, he made his way back to the scene. The tour guide and patient were long gone, 
And now, Ted is shuffling through a dark, haunted cemetery with a spotlight on him, basically ensuring that everything can see him, and he can't see a thing beyond the reach of the light. When he gets to the scene, there's no radio. Screw this, I'm out, he mutters to himself as he starts walking back to the rig. As he's walking, his imagination gets to him, and he feels like someone, or something, is following him. He starts walking faster. Michelle is standing in front of the rig, and she starts to notice this. Now she's watching him. Ted sees Michelle looking intently at him. He says, oh, frick, there is something following me. She must be looking at it. Now he's jogging, but too afraid to look back. Michelle sees this, and she slowly starts backing toward the rig. And Ted sees her moving. Now he's really worried about something chasing him. He breaks into a run. Michelle sees that, too, runs back to the rig, jumps inside, and locks all the doors. Fire can't see anything but a running Ted and a panicked Michelle, and they decide to nope out of there. They shut off the spotlight, but their truck is in gear, and they bail. Plunged into darkness, his mind racing through all the ways that he could die at the hands of supernatural forces, Ted screams and sprints the last 30 yards to the rig. Lungs burning for air, he yells to Michelle to unlock the door, which she does only after taking a good look to confirm he's indeed alone. What was out there? She asks. I don't know. I saw you run to the rig, so I ran, he exclaims. I ran because you ran. Forget it. Did you find the radio? She asks. At that moment, they both pause and look down to see the radio, upside down, in the charger. They knew it wasn't there earlier, and the fact that it just magically showed up was enough icing on this cake of creepy to convince them to head back to quarters. When they got back, Ted went to sleep on the couch opposite the TV on the wall. He suddenly wakes up a few hours later, but is unable to move and feels a weight pressing on his chest. He looks around for Michelle. No, the lights are off in her room. Then his eyes wander across the TV, and he sees this black, wispy form seem to materialize out of the screen and float down towards him. Right when it's inches away from his face, it disappears, and he's able to move and breathe again. He told the 7 to 3 shift what happened, and someone decided to put the wig up there to tease him. Thing is, not long after that night, other guys started getting pressed at night if they slept on that couch. Everyone blames Ted for bringing it back to the station. A permanent station was built for both units back in 2010. And as far as I know, no wigs or pressing ghosts have shown up since. Thanks for listening to these creepy and allegedly true horror stories from Hawaii. As always, if you enjoyed these stories, please be sure to hit that like button as it helps me out a ton. The more likes this episode gets, the more YouTube promotes it in the algorithm, and that helps the swamp grow its ever-expanding waters. If you're listening to this on Apple Podcast or Spotify, please be sure to give this a 5-star rating over there as it helps me grow on those platforms. It's very much appreciated. If you have a story that you would like to share in a future episode, be sure to submit it at swampdweller.net or the email you can find in the description down below. I would love to share your story with everyone here in the swamp. It's stories like yours that help keep this show going on a daily basis. Much love to my friend Derek Weber, who helped me read a few of these scary stories today. If you enjoyed his voice and the story, please be sure to check out the link in the description and give his channel a subscribe. You can also find him on the Dark Side of Gaming podcast on my second channel, where we share the darkest and creepiest mysteries, crimes, and everything else behind the gaming world. If you're on the go, but don't have YouTube Premium, but still want to download and listen to your favorite Swamp Dweller scary stories no matter where you are, you can download them absolutely free from Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher Radio, and just about anywhere else you find your favorite podcast online. 
If you'd like to support the swamp outside of all that, potentially check out our merch store. We've got t-shirts, hoodies, and more. I'd love to see you guys wearing some cool swamp threads. Don't forget to join me on Twitch as I stream over there multiple times a week. We play horror games, record scary stories, and all kinds of cool stuff over there. Be sure to join me on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook for behind-the-scenes action in the swamp. And I'll see you all soon with another creepy episode.